dedicated to the strength of the nation. Proudly, we hail. Yes, proudly we hail, starring John Payne in The Meadowlark, a United States Army and United States Air Force presentation. Now here is our producer, the well-known Hollywood showman, C.P. McGregor. Thank you, thank you, and greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to your theater of stars, where each week your motion picture favorites join us for your entertainment. John Payne is our star, and the title of our play, The Meadowlark. We'll have the curtain for Act One after this important message from Wendell Niles. Everywhere in the world, the uniform of the United States Army and the United States Air Force is more than just a uniform. It's a badge of courage and symbol of freedom and democracy. This fact has been true for more than a hundred years. True since the first American soldier set foot beyond our borders as a representative of our country and the principles for which we stand. No other armed service holds the respect of millions everywhere as ours does. Think of this, and you will have every reason to be proud of the men who wear the uniforms of the United States Army and the United States Air Force. Now, once again, our producer. The curtain rises on Act One of The Meadowlark, starring John Payne as Jeff Harker. I presume it was beautiful once, the farm country there around Harkersville. The travelers thereabouts probably described it with happy adjectives, green, verdant, productive. Well, that was long ago, if ever. The adjectives have grown somber with the period. Yes, Harkersville and the country around it stood bleak, dusty, and barren, end product of hard times. At the back door of his ramshackle farmhouse adjacent to town, Jeff Harker, whose uncle had founded Harkersville, pauses a moment before entering. He removes his hat, mops his forehead with a red bandana, stamps some mud off his feet, cheerfully opens the door and faces his wife. Evening, Bonnie. Wash your hands, Jeff. Supper's almost ready. Well, now, don't I get just a little hug? I said food's ready. All right, all right. And I hope you didn't track mud into my house. Why, I didn't. I almost certainly didn't. I spend my waking hours trying to keep this house halfway clean. Why, I scraped those feet of mine clean as the whistle of a jaybird. Just for you. Sit down before it gets cold. I wish I could set something more appetizing before you. Now, Bonnie, I never get tired of your vegetable stew. Well, if you're not tired of it now, you never will be. Well, what happened today besides it being so hot? Besides it being so hot, the washing machine broke down again. I was afraid that would happen. I had to do a week's wash by hand. Well, that's a shame, Bonnie. Oh, I don't mind the work, Jeff. But I get scared of my heart. With our baby coming on, my heart just starts pounding and pounding. Oh, you should have left your washing for me. Oh, you have your own work. Well, I'll look at the washer. It's probably that gear I tried to fix on it. You fixed it all right. I, I tell you what, I'll go into town tomorrow and pick up one from my cousin Bert. You got money to pay for it, I hope. <laughs> That's the least of my troubles, money. Huh. I think I'll take my coffee on the porch, Bonnie. It's cool out there. Come and sit with me a minute. I have so much to do. That's the trouble with you. You never take time to sit down a minute. Come on. Ah, that's a girl. Sit here on the swing and, and put your head on my shoulder. That better? Don't you be looking for gray hair. Why, Bonnie, you haven't a gray hair in your head. It's a wonder. Now, I know things haven't been as easy as they could be, but nobody knows it better than me. But let me tell you about a friend I met today. There he is now. Oh. That metal arc. Well... Anyway, there I was in the heat of midday trying to patch that barn roof. Sweat was just pouring off me, and I just mashed my finger with a hammer. I was ready to cuss a dictionary full when th this new friend of mine pipes up. Well, I just had to stop and look at him. He sounded so cheerful. Must admit, he looked pretty spiffy there with his yellow vest and black necktie, and suddenly it dawned on me. If I was thinking his way, I'd probably be just as pert and just as happy. Well, you know, I went to work on that barn roof patch and the patches, and I actually enjoyed it. And what's more, I didn't smack a fingernail the rest of the day. Oh, Jeff, you are the one. 
Too much pride to ask help of your Uncle Nate, who has more than he ever could spend. While your cousin Bert's feather in his nest. Working your heart out on these few scurvy acres. But, Jeff, you are a comfort. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm good for something. I... I don't mean to be acting mean, Jeff. You couldn't act mean if you wanted to, Bonnie. And don't you worry about our baby. I'll try not to worry, Jeff. And I promise you I'll get that part for your washing machine from Cousin Burton Town tomorrow. Hello, Bert. Well, well, Jeff, what brings you in town? Oh, I, I had to come in, Bert. You, uh, you in to see Uncle Nate? No, I'm not in to see Uncle Nate. Oh. Matter of fact, I haven't seen Uncle Nate for more than a year. I don't like to bother him. Well, good thing somebody thinks of him once in a while. I have to pay respects. Meaning you, Bert. Uh, meaning me. But, Bert, do you have to pay your respects with your hand out in front of you? Well, Uncle Nate is grateful that I, I think of him. <laughs> sure, sure, sure he is. How's the hardware business, Bert? Oh, it's terrible. One day you sell a little, the next day not so much. Like that. Well, anyway, let me have a gear like this, will you? Well, if you can pay for it, you just get it out and tell me how much. All right, Jeff. Here's your gear. That'll be eight dollars and fifty cents. Eight. Eight fifty. Well, it cost me over six dollars, Jeff. But a little gear like that—I I figured a dollar, a dollar and a half at most. Uh, sure, you didn't. You come in here speaking that smart talk. <laughs> it caught your language. Don't take it so heavy, Bert. Now listen, I'd have brought the eight fifty if I'd have thought. You're lying, Jeff, and you know it. Let me write you an I.O.U. I'm taking no I.O.U. from no bankrupt sugar beet farmer. Bert, Bert, this isn't for me. It's for Bonnie. She's going to have a baby, and she hasn't been strong as she should be. Trust me for the gear, Bert. I just can't go home without her. Sorry, Jeff. You don't run a business on sob stories. Maybe Uncle Nate will give you a handout. I'm sorry I mentioned it, Bert. You didn't bring it home, did you? I don't rightly think I need it. You didn't bring it home because you couldn't pay for it. And Bert wouldn't let you have it. Do you care how I do it? I said I'd fix your washing machine. You couldn't pay for it, could you? Could you? Maybe I couldn't. Oh, Jeff, what's the matter with you? Your Uncle Nate in town living in that big gable house with more than he'll ever spend. And look at us. I won't ask Uncle Nate for help. Not never. You're too proud to ask him. It isn't pride, Bonnie. Not that. I don't understand you, Jeff. It was the same way when you and Bert were kids living with your Uncle Nate. Bert was always the smart one, buttering up your uncle, getting him things he liked. I earned my keep. And I did lots of favors for Uncle Nate, too. Then why has Bert cashed in on his? Tell me that. But has he cashed in? Jumping every time my Uncle Nate waves his finger, kissing the dirty if I should ask him. No, Bonnie. Uncle Nate and I always understood each other. And he never had anything I wanted. Not really. Well, I'd not be proud he's kin of mine. If your Uncle Nate had built that sugar beet refinery, maybe all of us farmers wouldn't be starving like we are. That, that was up to him, Bonnie. Oh, you're impossible. Standing around here all day long with your talk about the meadowlark and us trying to scavenge some sort of existence out of this place. Now, Bonnie... And don't Bonnie me. I got a baby coming into this world, and what kind of world am I bringing it into? Filth and dust and no place to sell a crop. I hate it. Nothing to look forward to. Today like tomorrow, tomorrow like yesterday. I hate it. And most of all, I hate the one who could have made it easy for us all this time. The man who's bled every farmer around here of everything he's ever had. Your Uncle Nate. I wouldn't speak like that, Bonnie. Not of the dead. Uh, dead? What, what, what did you say, Judge Evans? Your Uncle Nate is dead, Jeff. Well, now. Not an hour ago to the bank. You better come in town with me. All right. I I won't be too long, Bonnie. All right, Jeff. It's mighty nice of you to come out like this, Judge Evans. Well, I wanted to notify you first, Jeff. Matter of fact, I thought it very important that you come right in. Oh? Why is that, Judge? Well, if the old man didn't change the will I made out not a week ago, you're going to get most everything he's got. We'll know at the bank. Well, I 
he threw up on Nate's box. Didn't think I'd be doing it this soon, Jeff. Like most people, I didn't have much love for your Uncle Nate. A lot of respect, though. There we are. Look at there. Look at the money there. Look at those hundred-dollar bills. Nate always believed money talk. Don't have to tell you that. Uh, here it is. Here's the will. Let's see here. Well, you're it, Jeff. You're a very wealthy man beginning this moment. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> Neither do I. I'll have to notify Bert, I suppose. Uh, listen, is that money mine? Well, after the probate it is. I'll take a couple of hundred of it now. Well, that isn't quite as it should be, but... Thanks. Where are you going, Jeff? Over to buy a washing machine. A brand new washing machine. <laughs> Uh, Jeff, if you come back to try and talk me out of that gear, you're wasting your time. I don't want no gear, Bert. I want to buy a brand new washing machine. Well, oh, but a brand new machine costs... Do you sell me the machine or not? Well, well, sure, Jeff, but you'll have to put at least a third down in cash. I'm paying all cash. Well, really, Jeff, where did you get the wind for? Never mind. What's the best machine you got? Well, oh, I have one for... One hundred and eighty-nine fifty. Oh, but surely... Put yeah. one on my truck. One with no scratches on the enamel. I don't want the enamel scratch for Bonnie. And when you're through, you better go see Judge Evans. He has news for you. Well, there, there's your new washing machine, Bonnie. You like it? Oh, it, it's almost too beautiful to touch. Oh, Jeff, with all this news, I'm sick. I talked so mean about Uncle Nate. Oh, he, he wouldn't mind. God bless his flint rock heart. He, he wouldn't mind. What are you going to do with all he left? Why, I think I'm going to build that sugar beet refinery. Oh, but Jeff, isn't that going to run into money? Everything Uncle Nate left us. But do you think it's the right time to start it? Say, thought you said Uncle Nate should have built it long ago. I thought you wanted it. But it was his money then, and we've been so up against it for so long. Oh, don't be hasty, Jeff. Now we finally got something. Don't do the wrong thing. We pause briefly from our story, The Meadowlark, starring John Payne, to bring you an important message from our government. Men, let's look at the record. Between July 1947 and October 1948, more than a quarter of a million forward-looking young men signed original enlistment papers with the United States Army. In addition, thousands of men re-enlisted and more than 100,000 veterans returned to the Army. If you look for them, you'll see the reasons. Technical schools where trades can be learned where the best equipment and the best tools are available while you increase your skill and your opportunity for advancement. There is job security, and there is the chance for rapid promotion. More, in the Army, there are free medical and dental care, food, clothing, and quarters. All in all, in the new peacetime United States Army, there are unlimited opportunities, opportunities that cannot be duplicated elsewhere. These are considerations which have moved almost half a million young Americans to stay in the Army rejoin the army, or sign enlistment contracts. Think this over, then learn the details. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station immediately. The curtain rises on Act Two of The Meadowlark, starring John Payne as Jeff Harker. Jeff's decision to build a huge sugar beet refinery with the money willed him by his uncle, Nate Harker, seems to be the needed shot in the arm to the community. Things are brightening up all over. The refinery is under construction, its huge form taking shape against the horizon, giving the community new confidence. Jeff and Bonnie have now moved into the Gable House in town. And as our scene opens, we find them in the living room. Jeff is moving furniture. A little further. Hmm? A little more. Hmm. Well, now you've gone too far back. Listen, 
How long does this go on? Stop complaining. Move it back, Jeff, just a smidgen. Ah, oh, that's just right. Well, I'm glad you're finally satisfied. How do you like your new house by now, Mrs. Harker? It's damp. Oh, it is? We need to keep those windows open. It's a fine old place, though. Come out in the yard. All right. See there, Bonnie? What? The finest storm cellar in town. Oh. Uncle Nate knew what he was doing. Hey, look at that yard there. And the elm tree. Isn't that a beauty? Good place for a swing for your child. Yes. He'll want a swing. <laughs> Here's my friend, the metalark. Same one? Sure. Come to live near us. <laughs> Sometimes, Jeff, you imagine things. Oh, I do? Listen, Bonnie. Who'd have thought looking at this house and this yard? Who'd have ever thought a month ago that we'd be here? That our new baby would come into this world? You don't mean to say that you... I had a hunch after meeting that metal one. Mm -hmm. I, I better be getting back to the building. You have to rush back there, Jeff. We're short-handed. A lot of the men been laying off lately. Oh. You, you're not worrying about anything, are you? No. I told you Doc Bond said any day now. That's good, Bond. I don't know why it should scare me so. I don't either. I really don't. <laughs> Hello, Jet. Oh, hello, Bert. Haven't seen you for quite a while, Bert. Uh, no, I uh, haven't intended to come over for some time to congratulate you. Congratulate me? Oh, don't act as if you don't know you won, Jeff. Well, it's all right, though. Say, this is quite a building you're putting up. You think so? Yeah. I admire your courage in the face of conditions. Courage of foolhardiness. I don't know which would be more correct. Oh, I think it'll work out all right. Well, at any rate, Jeff, you're helping business in town. My business, that, Bert. All my business. Hello, Jeff. Bert. Oh, hello, Judge Evans. Uh, goodbye. I'll, I'll be leaving now. Good luck to you on this refinery, Jeff. <laughs> You'll need it. What's Bert doing over here, Jeff? I don't know. Kept talking about how I was helping his business. All his business. What's he mean? Why, didn't you know? He's got a big piece of that roadhouse they just built, the glass slipper. Oh. That's right. He's going to get his eyelashes burnt. We're having trouble on account of that place. Men laying off. Oh, well. well what's on your mind, Judge? Oh, not much, Jeff. Just dropped by. Was interested to know about the baby. <laughs> Doc Bond says any time now. Oh, right, that's good. Hey, Jeff, look at that cloud over there. That black cloud. Yeah. Doesn't look too good. Over by Emeryville, looks to be. Hope they don't get it again. There was some tornado they had over there. Oh, Jeff. What is it, Miss Priscilla? Your wife just called. She says you better call Doc Bond and come a-running. Well, how do you like that? You timed it just right, Judge Evans. I sure did. I'll let you know whether it's a girl or a boy. Operator, will you get me Doc Bond? Okay. Yes? Doc, Doc Bond? Bond? Uh, this is Jeff Harker, Doc. The wife just called. I, I guess this is it. Well, I figured about 4 o'clock this afternoon. I wasn't too far off. Meet you at the house, Jeff. All right, Doc. Uh, if I bring you a boy, do I still get that statement? Certainly do, Doc. Just wanted to clarify everything. See you at the house. I'll hurry over, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, I'm so glad to see you. Well, now, shouldn't you be lying down? Well, I... This wind is blowing so hard, and no one here. Doc Bond isn't here yet? Oh, was he supposed to be? Well, he's on his way over. You sit down now. All right. Hello? Oh, uh, hello, Jeff. Oh, uh, hello, Doc. I just got home. I... Uh, Jeff... Uh, this looks like a real blow, a tornado. There's a tree down in my yard. I, I can't get out. Oh, but, Doc... I don't want to alarm you, but how is Bonnie? Well, I think... I I don't know. I mean, it, it's any time now. Jeff, you better get her down into the cellar until this blows over. Tell Bonnie to try to rest. You take it as easy as she can. I'll come over as soon as I can. All right, Doc. Come with me, Bonnie. I'm going to try and rig up a bed in the storm cellar. It's a tornado, Jeff. Well, it's 
quite a blow. What about Doc Bond? He'll be along directly. <laughs> There now. Jeff, where's Doc Bond? Where is he, Jeff? He's coming just as soon as he can. Oh, but Jeff, he's gonna be too late. Too late. No, he isn't, Bonnie. What if he doesn't come? We'll just have to do the best we can. Oh, Jeff, no. Keep a hold of yourself, Bonnie. Not in this wind without help, Jeff. I said to keep a hold of yourself, Bonnie. Oh, we've been married ten years. Jeff, Oz is a late baby, and they say... A I don't baby. care what they say. Nothing in God's world is going to deny you that baby. Nothing. There's your son, my darling. Oh, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> I make a pretty handsome midwife, don't I? You do, Jeff. You rest now. The storm's over. Just rest. Well, here's the proud father and the charming mother. Hello, Doc Bond. Hello. Not to mention this fine youngster. Jeff, I'll be buying you that Stetson hat tomorrow. <laughs> It's size seven, Doc. Yes, and you deserve it. <laughs> well, hello, Doc Bond. Jeff, Bonnie. Oh, hi, hello. Judge. And this is the Sprout. Huh? Fine-looking boy, Jeff. You better say that. And why not? He looks just like his mother. Uh, Jeff, <laughs> can I see you a minute? Sure. Excuse us, folks. Jeff, we got it almost as bad as Emeryville. How's the refinery? Damaged pretty bad, Jeff. Could be worse, though. Could be worse. What else? No casualty reports yet. Wind picked up the glass slipper. Blew it clear out of town. Ah, that's good. Matter of fact, it blew it two miles down the road, right on top of a little house Cliff Higgins was building. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it belongs. Uh, here's a fistful of wires that came through. I'm going to take Doc Bond with me. We're setting up headquarters in the courthouse. Get on over when you can. All right, Judge. Thanks. <laughs> Lair? All right. I'll open the window. How does it look out there? Well, it looks pretty bad to the eye. Most everything in sight blown around, Summer. Say, there's my friend. When he heard the blow coming, he just lifted himself up a little higher and forgot it. Was the refinery damaged? Yes, it was hit pretty hard. What are we going to do? Bonnie, please don't ask that. Don't try to look in the future. When we were on the farm, you tried it. And where were we a month later? In Gable House. Then with your baby, you tried to look ahead, and you trembled, and you weren't sure. And there's your baby right beside you. Things look pretty dismal out there, sure. But look at this fistful of telegrams already. Sending five trucks of milk. We were there, too. Signed, the people of Emeryville. And there's 20 more just like it. I think I understand you, Jeff. The thing is not what you're going to do. But when do we get started? The way is pretty well mapped. I see it now, Jeff. I do. Say, there's my friend again. You know, that's a cheerful sound. Just the kind of sound we need. Curtain falls in the final act of the Meadow Lot. Our star, John Payne, will return for a curtain call after this timely message from Wendell Niles. These are simple, basic qualifications which you are about to hear. And if you fill these qualifications, you will have the opportunity of a lifetime before you. Listen carefully. If you are between the ages of 20 and 26 and one half, with two years of college or the ability to pass an equivalent examination, and if you are physically fit, you may be able to become an aviation cadet in the United States Air Force. You may be able to take the training that will teach you to fly the best aircraft in the world 
with the best air force in the world, the United States Air Force. After you have successfully completed a full year of training, you'll receive a commission as second lieutenant in the Air Force Reserve, and you will have your pilot's wings. If you are among the highest in your class, you will receive a regular commission, and you will be on your way to a career with unlimited horizons. For full details, visit your nearest Air Force base or recruiting station at once. Now back at the microphone, our star, John Payne, and our producer. John, come out and take a bow for your performance. Thank you, C.P. And incidentally, Gail Russell and I both appreciate the fine plugs you gave us last week for El Paso when Dick Varan was here. You're welcome. It's a fine picture, and we'll all be primed to be on the lookout for it. And by the way, John, I was reading some things in Sigmund Space's new book, A History of Popular Music in America, that should be of interest to you. <laughs> About John Howard Payne and Home Sweet Home, I'll bet. Yes, uh, he was an ancestor of yours, wasn't he? Oh, about a 15th cousin, I guess. I haven't a genealogy on this, but according to what my father says, there seems to be some evidence that the families were related. How about some highlights on the song? Well, it was first written for the, for the opera, Clary, the Maid of Milan, by Sir Henry Bishop and John Payne. The heroine, Clary, sang it. Bishop wrote the music and Payne the lyrics. The song appears also in the lesson scene of Rossini's the Barber of Seville, and Home Sweet Home was the favorite encore of both Jenny Lind and Madame Patti. Dr. Space refers to an incident in the Oklahoma court, I believe around 1935, when the defending lawyer sang Home Sweet Home as a plea for clemency <laughs> for his clients, and he won his point. <laughs> that lawyer should have been in show business. Well, it is important Americana. Here's another interesting thing. Did you know that the first halves of Yankee Doodle, Dixie, and Home Sweet Home can all be sung together? Here's a chance for our listeners to try it. To me, one of the most interesting things about Payne was that though he wrote Home Sweet Home, he never actually had a home of his own. And two, he never made any money on the song. In fact, was hungry several times while, being, while it was being played on hand organs in the street. The real test for a song's popularity in those days. Yeah, the real test. If it gets around to the hand organs, the composer is in, if the poor guy didn't mind living on glory. Well, C.P., it's been nice seeing you, and before I leave, what's in store for us next week? Next week, John, and ladies and gentlemen, we present lovely Vera Ralston in a heartwarming romantic comedy titled The New World Look. It's the story about the age-old question, love which conquers all. You won't want to miss Vera Ralston in this delightful story. Well, that sounds good, and I'll be listening. Goodbye. Goodbye, John Payne. Be sure to join us next week, ladies and gentlemen, when we bring you Vera Ralston in The New World Look. Until then, this is C.P. McGregor saying thanks for listening and cheerio from Hollywood. John Payne appeared to the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, which arranges for the appearance of all stars on this program. The script was by Rich Hall, with music under the direction of Eddie Scrivener. The program was transcribed in Hollywood for release at this time. Wendell Niles speaking. <laughs>